investment. one eight seven seven eight silver on the real money show dot com. Want to turn it over to our guest who's uh, finally arrived. Good to have him on the air once again. I think this is visit number three, Mr. Gerald Salente. Again, we've got Gerald Salente with us on the show. Great to have you, Gerald, as always. Oh, thanks for having me, as always. And um, it's always great to go through the Trends Journal. Um, for anyone who is interested, you can go to trendsresearch.com, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Um, we want to get right into the markets on, on gold and silver, um, particularly in, in in a portion of the, the recent Trends Journal under delaying the inevitable. You talk about the markets being rigged and the implications for that. Uh, what do you see as the, the future in terms of the current rising stock market? Or in this case, we just saw a little bit of a pullback. But w- what do you think the implication of, of rigged markets are? Well, it, it's obvious is that like with any – it's a Ponzi scheme. It's, it's like with any criminal activity, at some point it collapses. And when you're looking at the markets, I mean, let's look realistically about it. China keeps saying they're not going to put any more stimulus in, and – in what the next day they do, and now they're lowering interest rates and making loans easier to get. It's estimated that 25% of China's GDP is housing related. And looking at the numbers that are available, and remember, it's not a very transparent government. You know, it's a one 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 um, a party government. You're looking at some 70 million luxury apartments that stand vacant. And then you go take a trip to the EU, and every week we keep hearing about Mario Draghi. Is he going to put in quantitative easing, and now they have negative interest rates. Take a look over here in the United States. They haven't raised interest rates since 2006. So the whole thing is a Ponzi scheme. It's being pumped up with cheap money, and where is the cheap money going? It's going into the equity markets, because at one time, people used to be able to take whatever little extra money they had and put it in the bank, and the bank would pay them interest. But you don't get any interest now when interest rates are virtually zero in the States and negative interest rates over in Europe. So going back to it, you're looking at merger and acquisition activity as we speak that's rivaling 2,007 levels because of all the cheap dough. So now they're talking about raising interest rates. It's very simple. When interest rates go up, the economy goes down. We just saw here in the States durable good orders fell 18.2% in August. They can make up any kind of fairy tale they want as to why they slipped that much. And then you could go back and look at the employment numbers. And you can make up any story that you want why they were weak the last month or the month before. The fact of the matter is, if numbers were strong, if the economies were strong, you would not have this kind of fluctuation. And then, as you mentioned, when you look at the markets, you can see what's happening there. Yeah, the Nikkei is, you know, it's at seven-month highs. Big deal. They keep pumping cheap dough into it. But then how much did their GDP drop in the last quarter? Over 7%. Could you imagine that? A 7% fall-off of a GDP? That's huge. But the equity markets are doing fine because of the cheap dough that keeps the speculation going. And uh, that's why uh, it's it's being pumped up. So, and if we look at the the fallout of that as well, you notice that, uh, and I do see them personally as interrelated, you start to see, okay, the stock market's going up, that's great. It's, It's clearly because low interest rates are manipulating the market. Where do they put with that excess equity, et cetera? But now you see that, there's geopolitical crisis, there's political debacles everywhere, uh, dire economic warnings, as you were just mentioning. And now we're starting to see increasing social disturbances and, and as you talk in the Trends Journal about some environmental threats. So how do you see the current economic issues and especially as how that relates to lower gold and silver prices, which we've seen lately? Well, the lower gold and silver prices and staying on gold, 
uh, our forecast is gold, gold has more of a downside to it to a moderate extent. And the shock is going to be felt when interest rates go up. But as we, we're talking about what's going on in the real world, you cannot sustain an economy with even zero and negative interest rates. So that is going to cause a panic in itself. When interest rates go up, the uh, carry trade collapses in the emerging markets, and there's no longer the ability to sustain the phony growth of the equity markets. So in fast-forwarding a little bit, they'll come up with a new scheme with a different name to call quantitative easing. When that happens, that's when we are forecasting the beginning of the next bull run. It will follow the rise of interest rates. The rise of interest rates will only have, as we see it, a temporary impact in driving down gold and silver. But that, that increase in interest rates is going to cause panic on the streets. They can't keep the fraud going without cheap dough. And when that panic hits, gold goes. And let's not forget the geopolitical strife that's going on. The Middle East is up for grabs. If anybody listened to Obama's speech at the United Nations, it was a speech of more war, unending war, more, more interference in global affairs. The United States and its NATO allies has effectively declared a war against Syria. They're going into a sovereign country. And what's the reason? ISIS. They beheaded two guys. They beheaded two guys that went into a foreign country that, you know, was up for grabs. But they beheaded them. And that made all the news. And everybody, oh, look how evil, look how... Hey, how about those drone strikes? Oh, they only killed, what, 14 yesterday in Pakistan? How about the millions of people that, people that have been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan by the United States military since the beginning of the Iraq War. Bombs are okay, beheadings bad, and now they're, now they're coming out Al Jazeera, which, by the way, is from Qatar, that is owned by the Qatar government, which is part of the so-called coalition that's attacking Syria, reported that some 23 civilians have just been killed with the United States attacks in Syria. So the point that I'm making is that the whole world is now up in arms about we have to stop ISIS, we have to go into Syria, as they're wiping out people anyway. Not to mention what just happened in Gaza. So we're looking at more war. With more war comes more geopolitical instability. With more geopolitical instability, gold becomes the safe haven asset that it has been since the beginning of recorded history. And they're not going to be able to rewrite that history. And we'll take a short break. More of uh, Gerald Salente coming up here. The number to call one eight seven seven eight silver and the real money show dot com. Hang on. One eight seven seven eight silver and the real money show dot com online. Now back to more of our interview uh, with Gerald Salente. Hedge fund manager in Hong Kong, William K. Uh, he worked with Goldman Sachs uh, 25 years ago in mergers and acquisitions. He, he was quoted recently as saying that investors should continue to buy gold and silver. They should find a place outside the banking system to store it, and they should count their wealth in ounces, not in fiat currencies such as the U.S. dollar as an example. Uh, because the day will come very, very soon and that investors will be happy that they made that investment in gold and silver. Well, what do you think of his statement and I guess how that relates to, to these well, – geopolitical strife that's going on? It's a statement I've been making for years. I've been buying gold since 19, late 1970s. My first buy was 187 50 an ounce. And I just keep buying it and putting it away. Gold is for my golden age. I don't trade it. Uh, I, have about, I have about 15 to 20% assets in silver, the rest, of course, in real estate. Um, but even that, the real estate I buy, I buy for passion and joy and, and creating beauty, not for not the profit opportunity only. So 
to me is why would anybody want to own dollars or euros or yuan when they're just paper currencies based on nothing and backed by nothing? And again, I'm old enough to remember when uh, Richard Nixon uh, took us off the gold standard. And the rationale at that time, and remember, this is 1971. You know, World War II only ends in 1945. And the United States was still at its peak. And they could get away with saying that the strength of the dollar is based on the strength of the United States. Well, that's no longer true anymore in terms of economy. Not when we're over $17 trillion in debt and continue going deeper. So to me, you know, I don't give financial advice. Only for myself, I keep buying gold and silver, and I have my, all my retirement into it. And as far as putting it in the banks, I've written in the Trends Journal the horror stories I've had uh, trying to get money out of banks when um, financial conditions became unstable. And if anybody needs a little re- recounting in history, go back to 1933 when they called a bank holiday. Isn't that a nice word? Isn't that a wonderful word, holiday? A day to screw you. A day to, to tell you you can't get your money out. A holiday. Your holiday from you being able to take what's yours. And what did they do? They made the American people turn in all their gold. Gold certificates, bullion, coins. And what did they do? They made them sell it, what was it, like $22 or $20, 22 62 or something? And they, after they got all the gold in, or they thought they did, they repegged the price of gold at $35 an ounce. How's that to shaft you out of 70% of your spending power? They devalued the dollar. So to me, is why would you give something so valuable for someone else to hold? If you don't have it, it's not yours. And I could keep going on with the stories. 9-11 tried to get my money out of the... Uh, out of, out of CDs and turn it into gold, and I couldn't get it out because Wall Street was closed. Sorry, Mr. Salenti, certificates of deposit of financial instruments. But don't worry, when Wall Street reopens a week later, you'll be able to get your money if it's still there. <laughs> so, you know, so again, this is an old story. If you don't have it, you don't own it. And why would you, and to me, again, only speaking for myself, I do not give financial advice. You know, gold and, and, and silver are, are the uh, investments for me. Again, a lot, I buy, the, the real estate I buy is historic real estate. You know, I don't buy um, on speculation. Uh, I want to get into um, some of the things that are happening um, for you in terms of events, but I, I do have a question. Seeing as you're, you're a friend from, from the South here um, in, the, in the United States, there's a great quote from, from Winston Churchill. He says, the United States never fail to do the right thing after they've exhausted all other possibilities. And with Barack Obama's uh, rating being at the lowest approval rating, um, do you think that the U.S. can eventually make some good decisions here? Not with the criminal operations that are in control. The Bloods and the Crips, people like to call them the Democrats and Republicans, they're murderers and thieves. They've started wars on, based on lies and killed millions of people and continue to do it. So when I say murderers and thieves, I don't say that sarcastically. I say it based on fact. And thieves, because they keep stealing all our money in the names of too big to fail and taxes to keep doing dirty deals, to keep pumping up their buddies, keeping the Ponzi schemes going, deregulating the society so the, the, the money is in the hands of the few and the opportunities and entrepreneurial opportunities are all but disappearing. So the word justice now in America means just us. You haven't seen one head roll on Wall Street for the criminal activities. All they do is get slapped with with these little fines, slap-on-the-wrist fines, and no one does any time. So, no, I don't see it changing at all, uh, considering who's in power. Here, look what's going on now with all the war talk going on in the States and in Canada and in, and in, in much of Europe. Have you heard anybody talking about peace? Have you heard one peace song? Nothing. Zero. Nada. 
71% of the American people are in favor of bombing Syria. Oh, yeah, Syria. Look what they've done to the United States. I think they invaded Topeka last week. Oh, Syria. Them Syrians? Not one word of peace. All you hear is war. And this is what I've been writing about for years. You saw the panic of 08. We're seeing history repeat itself. Go back to the crash of 1929. Followed by a depression. Followed by a great recession. There's no recovery. Currency wars, trade wars, world wars. When all else fails, they take you to war. And the war drums are beating. All you have to do is listen to President Obama's talk at the U.N. It's there for everyone, everyone to listen to and pay attention to. And all it is is war talk. So um, uh, just for our listeners, if they want to get the Trends Journal, how would they go and get that, Gerald? Oh, simply TrendsJournal.com, TrendsJournal.com. And we also have a Trends Monthly that's part of the subscription. And each night, weekday night, we do trends in the news, the real news that's going on, not the stuff the prostitutes are selling. And uh, also we're having conferences. We have conferences here in Colonial Kingston. We have people from all over the world coming. The last one was in August, another one coming up in mid-October. And this one I'm going to teach people how to track trends. That's what I've been doing now since 1980. I've written the, wrote the book on it. So we're going to show them the global nomic processes on how to identify, forecast, and track trends. One other question. This is Paul speaking, Gerald. How would, if you are buying gold, silver, what is the best way to to hold it? Is it a depository like we have outside the banking system, or is it to take it home, bury it in the back garden? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, I, I'd leave that up to the individual. You know, it's, it's because if I told them to bury it in the back garden and something happened to it, then they would blame me. You know, so I, I leave it up to the person to make their own decision. But what I would say is that if I was somebody else, if I was somebody out there and buying gold, one of the places I would not put it in is a bank depository, a bank safety deposit box, considering the fragility of the banking system, the amount of derivative debt that they're holding, and just look what went on. I mean, you know, Cyprus isn't ancient history, and now they're talking about bank bail-ins. So the reality is, if there's a terrorist strike, be it false flag or real, and there's a financial crisis because the markets, to me, are way over-leveraged and overpriced, they're going to do everything they can to make sure that you pay for the problem. And that paying for it may be taking what you have. And, of course, they'll blame it on those terrorists for destabilizing the sound economies and for giving the governments the right to steal what's yours. Well, we want to we want to keep staying in touch with you, Gerald, because it's always great to to hear your point of view and see your take and where you where you see things going and, and following your trends. Uh, great to have you. Well, thank you, Jeremy, Paul, and everyone else. Great.